Over these weeks since Easter, we have been on a journey into wholeness. It is a journey that has allowed us to look at the 12 steps that originated with Alcoholics Anonymous as sacred art. Each week, we have continued to realize these steps are not only for people in the rooms of recovery. These steps can be life-changing for all of us because within them, there is a great wisdom. We began with step one by looking at the gift of powerlessness and coming to understand that the admission of our own powerlessness is not a one-time event. Coming to understand our powerlessness is something we must continually return to throughout the whole of our lives. This first step is the foundation of all the other steps, and it leads us to the hope of restoration and the necessity of our making a decision to be free as we surrender our will to a power greater than ourselves. These steps bring us to a place where we can search our egos as we consider the possibility of taking a moral inventory of ourselves an inventory which honestly and unabashedly examines the vices that haunt our lives. And while that inventory can cut us to the core, the fifth step asks us to admit and to confess our wrongs to God, to ourselves, and to another person. We have all been learning in these weeks that confession is oh so good for the soul. So when we get to step six, we find ourselves more than ready to have the Holy One remove all our defects of character. And in step seven, we humbly ask the Holy to remove our shortcomings. This week, we come to the steps which ask us first to make a list of all persons we have harmed and then to become willing to make amends to them whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. It is one thing to say to ourself or to someone else or to God that we have been in that we have been generically I have trouble saying that word this morning that we and this is an important part that we have been generically dishonest generically that we have lied betrayed a confidence, gossiped, slandered, neglected, abused, or intentionally used someone. But it is quite another thing to systematically go through the years of our lives, remember our offenses, and then picture in our mind the face and name of the person or persons on the receiving end of our wrongs. While all the steps are hard, this is a daunting process. But then nobody ever said recovery was easy. Some of us can remember quite well the times when we were at our worst. There may be specific moments or we may know that our addiction to alcohol or drugs or control covered an entire relationship spanning a lifetime. And as hard as it is to make this kind of list, the second part asks us to become willing to make amends to them all. For some of us, this is going to take a lifetime. And yet, wrapping our mind around saying we are sorry to those we have injured, revealing to them that we have become aware of what we did 
and how it must have hurt them. That is filled with both pain and beauty. Two weeks ago, we first read the story from the Gospel of Luke. You may have noticed in this series, we've repeated some of these stories. They're so full and they're so important that we don't want to leave any part left unsaid. The story that is usually titled The Prodigal Son is about realizing we have harmed and about making amends for that harm. Writing about step nine, an author who's been in recovery for a long time said, making amends to someone directly whenever possible is one hell of a step. If you've ever done this, you know she's exactly right. She notes the difficulty in simply trying to make contact with someone we left behind or discarded out of our self-centered pursuits. The young man in this story found that taking his inheritance, leaving home, pursuing his own agenda, wrecked havoc in his life. But it also left behind a father who loved him dearly. Simply not knowing what was happening to his son must have been devastating. If we are in recovery, if we are working the 12 steps, each one of us has a story about our personal pig pen. And no matter what our rock bottom was or where it found us, it was perhaps one of the greatest gifts we will ever receive. Because without a rock bottom, we would still be deep in our addictions. Sometimes in the middle of our rock bottoms, we do come to our senses and we realize we cannot do this anymore and we certainly cannot do this alone. The son hits rock bottom. He admits his wrongs and he begins to desire a restoration with his father, something he thinks is quite frankly impossible. He cannot imagine reconciling with his father and regaining his place as a son. He believes this will never happen. But he begins to wonder if perhaps he can go back and just become a servant in his father's house. When he gets home, he confesses to his father what he did wrong, and he begins to make amends and try to the best of his ability to set things right and to begin living again. The 12 steps tell us that making amends is an opportunity to choose the kind of person we would like to become. With this realization, we can cease to set ourselves apart from others. We can admit we have made mistakes, and we can do what we can to correct them. It is our actions which show we have enough respect for ourselves and for others to own up to the harm we have done. We strive to be fair, honest, and mature, and we remember that the purpose of making amends is to do what we can to heal ourselves and our relationships and to set ourselves free. No matter where we are in our lives, we all, as Father Richard Rohr says, need to do some cleanup work inside. Our normal default leads us to make unwritten lists of the people who have harmed us. We are not programmed to turn the table and make a list of people we have harmed. In order for us to know where to begin, there needs to be a slow softening of our hearts, a gradual lessening of our attachment to our own hurts, a letting go of our victimhood 
as a past identity and a letting go of our need to punish and humiliate others. It very likely may take us a long time to make amends, to become willing even to make amends. Here again, we can listen to the wisdom of people in recovery. Some individuals spend years going to meetings that just work on step eight. In those meetings, they learn to make lists, but not of what others have done to them. Instead, people in recovery through working through the other seven steps have been given I don't know my computer language well enough to do this right, probably, but new software or a program, but a program that's called Grace, which is a new pattern or a new mind or perhaps even totally a new processing system. So now instead of making lists of people who hurt us, we make lists of people we have hurt, we have failed or mistreated, and then, then we do something about it. It might be a note, a call, a visit, a meaningful gift, an invitation, perhaps even an outright apology. If we are patient and if we listen to others who have walked this path before us, we will find a way, a place, a time, and the words we need. And sometimes the opportunity will even present itself to us. I remember a night long after one of our grandchildren had been born. Our oldest daughter and I left the baby with his father and his papa, and we stole away to have dinner and do some shopping. It was a really great night. But driving home in the dark, seemingly out of nowhere, she began to cry. In the midst of the tears, she asked me why I never gave her advice about being a mother, why I didn't tell her what to do with this sweet child. I was flabbergasted because I thought I was being a really good non-meddling mother. She was a very good mom, and I just thought if she needed help or advice, she would ask. It took me several years to realize my part of this issue. I, of course, never had any problem telling our children when they were growing up the best way to do absolutely everything. So through the years, I had to do things continually over and over again to learn the ways in which I learned that my control issues had been harmful to my children. Not something any mother wants to have to admit. Some of those issues and instances came from fear and anxiety that I carried about their well-being. Others simply came because, yes, I really did think I knew what was best. But once I realized what a problem that was, I struggled with how to be in relationship with them. I went from being over-involved to being under-involved. See, that was the easiest fix for me. I'm very either-or about a lot of things. But that easy fix was not the best way for me to have relationships that were loving and supportive. Making amends meant I had to do some work. And it wasn't easy work then, and it certainly continues not to be easy work now. I have always wondered about the rest of the story of the prodigal son. What happened to him, to his father, to his older brother as the years went on? While the story is a parable and there is not a rest of the story in this instance, there certainly is the rest of the story in each of our lives. 
Making amends is not a one-time event. It is not once and done. It is an ongoing practice of life that we all need to learn. We will always do things that hurt or even harm people that we love and people we don't even know. Perhaps the wisdom in these steps lies in learning to constantly ask God for the wisdom to see our faults, our mistakes. At the end of every 12-step meeting, people hold hands in a circle and say together the serenity prayer. It had been a long time, as you may know if you were here last week, since I have been in an Al-Anon meeting. But this Friday at 12.30, I found myself in one of those rooms. I was very tearful when I got there, not crying, but knowing I could cry. And I had to say to myself, get it together. It was a room filled with people, people who had families and people they loved and parents and brothers and sisters who were dealing with addiction. So when they shared, they talked about what it had done to them. Because those meetings are not about the other person. They are about us. So I want to invite you this morning as we close. If you know the serenity prayer, I'd love for you to say it with me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. May it ever be so. May it ever be so for all of us. Amen.